I'm Maria Menunos, and you're tuned in to AfterBuzz TV, the ESPN of TV talk. Now, let the buzz begin. Hey, everybody. Uh, Roxy, let's get it out of the way. Comfy sweater week two. It's all about the comfy, right? I feel like you should have texted me, Sean, because I have comfy sweaters here, too. Well, uh, people, no offense, and people love your looks and outfits, but it's always about my jacket a little bit, mm, right? Th that does sound accurate. Yes, yes. That I'm is not trying to be rude. I mean, it's we haven't said, oh, what jacket is Roxy wearing? What sweater is Roxy wearing? That's a good point. My name is not on the show either, so it is valid. It oh. is valid. Well, we talk about uh, we talk about my clothes a lot, and uh, we have a very special guest here today, Roxy, who, uh, speaking of comfort, has always made me comfortable on a set and any time I've worked with him, and as a friend, and he, his DP extraordinaire and director, Brandon Trost, um, he is with us today. And the crowd um, goes wild. <laughs> and the crowd goes wild. And uh, we are just kind of going to be talking about, we've had, you know, episodes about getting onto a set and things like that, but we want to talk about what does a DP do to understand it, how it affects us. Uh, Brandon's obviously his career and, and, you know, his journey he's run into, run into, worked with, uh, collaborated with and directed lots of different actors. So, you know, uh, it's kind of be two parts. It'll be the DP part, and then we'll talk about the directing part as he's done both. Um, and then at the end, unless, uh, unless I get a thumbs down, am I allowed to talk about our latest project, Brandon, that we worked on together? I, you know, I think we can talk about it probably okay. generally, uh, maybe. Yeah, in a general. <laughs> right? it's just because it's not out yet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Since it's not out yet, of course, of course, it's just going to be general questions about that. Obviously, not a, uh, about a lot. Um, and as always, I have Miss Phenomenal Roxy Stryer as my co-host. Happy to be here. It's uh, nice to do from the comfort of my home, but I will say, Sean, I miss sitting in the same room with you. I uh, do. We have a fun time, right? We do. It, it's it's different like this, but I will say that I'm so impressed. Just as a quick uh, after buzz shout out to the amount of shows they are doing right now and how yeah. and it, they're like crushing it right now. Um, and so I'm glad we're able to continue doing this show because I if I was not doing this with you right now, I would be very alone and really upset. Yeah, yeah. Well, you also have beautiful flowers next to you. And I think it shames my whole sweater thing, by the way. In fact, while we're in this quarantine, we should see what beautiful accoutrement does Roxy have next to her this week? Well, I don't know how many things I'll be able to get. These flowers will be here until they die. Uh, and then I'll yeah, be left with a blank wall behind me. But I, <laughs> I did bring some uh, for set decoration. I do have some uh, nerdy Funkos with me. So does that count? Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So uh, let's see. But before we get into the topic and talking to Brandon, we'll always can, we're going to do Sean's week as always. And I think Sean's week has to be the coronavirus, you know, week two vibe. I don't know what that means to us, but as always, we'll just give it a try. One, two, three. Sean's, Sean's week. week. Wow, that was, we were way off. Why? We, we weren't at the same time. No, I thought we were amazing. It sounded good on my end. Oh, it did sound cool, but we weren't at the same I, time. I went for we a scrub-a-dub-dub. Dub. What'd you do? Uh, I think it was more just like a, a monotonal, like Paul said over the universe. We missed, we missed uh, Mr. Fantabulous. For yeah, it. Mr. That's Fantabulous why. is yeah. not here today. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, so that's that's our intro to Sean's week, Brandon. Um, that's it's very uh, professionally done. It's very uh, professionally done. It's high yeah, grade, it's high as tech. you can see. Very tech. Um, also action, action packs. Yeah, yes. <laughs> action, yes. yeah, a lot of different flavors. A lot mm -hmm. of different flavors going through there. Uh, basically, I've done. Uh, I started up on coaching again. I am getting hit up for people who want to do Skype coaching, which is nice. Um, my sketch comedy class is obviously kind of done. 
uh, building my TikTok, having a lot of fun with that. I'm uh, probably going to reach 20,000 followers by this evening, which will be nice. Um, I tried Dang, something. New that's amazing. In a month. That's a month. Go, Sean. Uh, Get it, Sean. Yeah, so that's pretty good. And I just, I told you, it's the first social media that I've really understood, liked, had fun with. Uh, I did a contest yesterday, which was so interesting. I acted out a weird character and I said, what do you think this character's name should be? It's kind of like the ducky, the friend, the friend zone friend in a romantic comedy, but you couldn't, you had, they had to make up a name. And the girl who won was named uh, Steph Lynn, who she came up with the name Gibson because music is always the friend of all creative women. And so she said Gibson and that got the most votes. So very interesting but I've, they've never done like contests like that before so i'm just gotta say i completely didn't fun. understand what you just said at all about that but i, I what I, do you mean like she said well she's a musician she said, she's oh, a musician so okay. gibson guitar gibson yeah, yeah. guitar yeah you no know i know the guitar? no i knew i do i'm still new to the tiktok world i understand no, this is just a contest that has nothing to do with anything about tiktok like i just kind of made it up yesterday so you're very creative sean that's what I like to do on there. I mean, I'm sadder. I'm, I wish more of my funny ones were as popular, but everybody, of course, wants to hear stories from Twister and people under the stairs. And those ones are the ones that blow up. Like they blow up huge. So okay. huge. So, that makes sense. Makes sense. So what would uh, Roche that's, do? Yeah. Ro well, here's the weirdest one. Everyone's asking me about Twister. And when I, I posted one about Roach, and then everyone asked about Twister. So for me, I think, oh, that one's gonna blow up. Twister, when I do the Twister one, because it's a much bigger movie. The Roach one is like past 100,000 views and the Twister one's like 17,000 views. And I was like, why? And my daughter said, well, you're more memorable and people under the stairs. You know what I, I mean? Think also right now, Twister pandemic season is like too close to home for people. <laughs> so maybe. maybe. But people love that movie. I mean, they yeah, were all no, begging it's amazing. for a story. It's they were amazing. begging for a story from it. So that's why I thought it's very hard to figure out what's going to blow up and not. And I, then I sang a song about having a chicken avocado wrap from El Pollo Loco for 10 seconds. And that one's huge. So you never know. You just don't know. Uh, so that was kind of been my week. Had, had a little stomach issue yesterday. Got very nervous for a few hours. And then luckily it passed. So... You just, you know, when it's, it's the stomach, you know, it's not Corona though, Sean. So you're fine. No, no, no. It's now a new thing. Now it's one of the new symptoms is they can say it starts that way. So no way. Uh, yeah. None so of us are safe. Just, I know. I know everything. And then your nerves like hit your stomach. So you never really know. So um, we are going to talk to Brandon, like I said, about all these things. And we're going to touch upon the latest project. Um, it's going to be interesting. You're going to love it as a viewer. So I would think you'd want to help us out. Roxy, Roxy. Okay. Can we just stop for a second? My non in studio. Oh my God. Oh my God. So well, Sean, you want to know what, what kills a transition when you comment what? on how good you are at transitioning. <laughs> just it's just not smooth like you so don't lame. i was like Super look at lame. him look at him he's got it he's smooth sailing and then you were like eh, take this i, to I ruined it reaching I ruined it but here's the deal truth be told right now uh this is as fun for us always as it is for you guys because this is our social interaction for the week so i i love being here and i'm so glad you guys are joining us and uh it's a great way to get involved live in the chat uh, on our YouTube, also Apple Podcasts. We read all of the comments that you guys have and we give a few shout outs during the show. This week, because we are on quarantine, I wanted to give a couple additional shout outs than we usually give because I know that you guys, it's cool to have your comments read. And I, I was going back uh, through some old videos and on one of our videos where we talked about self tapes, how to make your own self tape, which we thought was a great episode, Sean, I wanted to read four different comments from here to give a bunch of people shout outs. They're short and wow. sweet, but thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, Jobiak420 says, just discovering this really insightful with tons of great tips. Really appreciate you. Thanks for saying that. Uh, Weston Ira says, this show is so underrated. Speaking of underrated, 
Who is the most underrated person that you've worked with? Sean, rapid fire answer. Most underrated person you've worked with, go. Most underrated person, uh, an actress named Hetty Barrest, who's just the funniest woman in the world. Wow, you had an answer for that. Uh, Ariana Rodriguez says, wow, so helpful. We'll use these tips. And uh, Demetrius Smith said, great info. So thank you guys all to everybody who's watching. Nice. Keep commenting. Again, everywhere our pod- podcasts are, but specifically uh, Apple Podcasts, we read all of those comments and on YouTube. And if you write something, you will get a shout out. I'm also going to be in the live chat today. So just so you guys know, every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific time, that's when we go live. So if you ever want to join us live to ask questions, comments, et cetera, that's where we are. Uh, so make sure you come join the fun. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, now I want to, as we break down, as I always do when I have a guest, a um, lot of the time we are, you know, people, friends of mine and stuff like that. So they always like to know how we met. And so Brandon, do you remember how we met? We met uh, in the FP. Yeah, no, I, I remember. Uh, I remember very well. The first time I met you, your nipples were exposed. Um, That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was part of your costume. I know that. Was that well, part I had of my costume. We had we had never met. You had worked with my brother Jason on, um, I think it was a Rob Hall movie, right? Yeah, or Rob Hall movie Laid to Rest in Maryland. Um, in Maryland, yeah. So you guys worked together on Laid to Rest, and I know that my brother had brought you up as someone who was just awesome and really cool to work with. And of course, I knew you from you know Roach fame, because uh, yeah, <laughs> as I always have, but. Um, you know, when we were casting this movie, The FP, that my brother and I made, that, that we that we directed together, um, we ended up casting you as uh, this character, Stacy's dad, who we kind of played as like a uh, like a trans gendered trans you know character. Yeah. <laughs> we dress you up and in then, like well, the, skippy the, little the, clothes. The mislead. The mislead is you you hear him yelling through a trailer, so you're picturing the stereotypical like heavy oh, yeah, guy with the wife beater and the, the yeah, big, like white trash, uh, angry, yeah, white, overprotected yeah. dad. Yeah. 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 And then yeah, the big reveal is that you're basically not wearing any clothes and you got um, makeup all over your face and you looked insane. Yeah. Yeah. A, uh, <laughs> it was a great part. And we had a well, great, that's how we met. that was a great day. Huh? That was a great day. We had so much fun and was- uh, we all became friendly after that. And so that's how we met, but take us, you know, your journey, I know your dad, obviously, was in the entertainment business doing special effects, but what made you choose out of, you know, all the things, your sister obviously is a costumer and Jason's writer yeah. and director. Well, I mean, what made you want to be a DP? My, my whole family is in the film industry, you know, and, and it's, all, it's all that I've ever known. I've never, uh, I've never even had a job my whole life not in the film industry in one way, shape, or form. That goes way back to being a kid and just doing stuff in the summer. But um, I think because of that, it just I've never, I never imagined myself doing anything else. It's something I've always loved. It's something I've always liked. You know, my dad, um, my dad does special effects, and that's what I grew up doing with him as a kid. So did my brother and sister. And uh, you know, through that. I think that I always thought I was going to do special effects. I, I loved it. I wanted to do it. My dad was kind of grooming me to start okay. a company at some point. And right. uh, the, you know, I, he kind of turned me around. It was, to be honest, it was my dad who sort of pitched me on the idea in a way. I remember I was like 16 and, you know, he was like saying how special effects is great. And if it's something I want to do, that's awesome. But he said, look, you know, it's kind of a dying industry with the advent of, you know, computer generated effects because he does mechanical like physical effects like on set stuff like fire practical explosion, stuff like that practical effects yeah and you know that work kind of shrinks up and it's just hard it's just it, he just i think he was trying to protect me from saying look if you love it do it but you know you could also look into this other thing right. which i think you might be interested in which is cinematography and i was like gee that sounds interesting but you know but why and he's like well you kind of remind me of a lot of dps i've worked with the way that you talk about films, oh, wow. you analyze movies demeanor said, wise yes yeah. i think demeanor wise yeah he 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 said that he told me that i reminded him of dps that he worked with me like in the past that's and what also, I never I think, and i think also just my like just general approach to film as well because you know he liked i think because we got to see inside how movies were made as kids for me it made me like movies even more it wasn't like it it took the magic away it was like i wanted more of it it's it's like seeing mm. like all the 
you know, all the magician's tricks in a way before you, yeah. you know, to, to like, to be exposed to that from the get go. So I knew I always wanted to make movies. And on I that for just, a second, I, because we have so many people out there, uh, all the fans out there who are artists who are trying to figure out which path to go down, what are the defining characteristics or mannerisms or demeanor of a DP? Like, how do you know if somebody fits the DP role? You know, that's hard to say because there's so many different people and so many different attitudes and just persona types out there to be honest from most of the stories i hear from a lot of dps i'm surprised my dad would think i seem like a dp at all because i feel like i'm relatively stress free stress free and pretty chill and like i don't know i just kind of right. try to approach everything from a very just logical and easy way that kind of makes the day easy for everybody that's not always the case for everybody but that's the same way it is in kind of any industry i think when it comes down to it I mean, there's a lot of big personalities and there's a lot of smaller ones uh, so i don't right. know you know I, I don't know how uh how else to really explain that? Well, the only thing I can say is that I basically just heeded my dad's advice. I looked into it. It seemed interesting. I was like, yeah, I can have more creative control. That sounds fantastic. And then I just sort of dove in, went to film school, and I, it turned out that I had a knack for it. I had never done any, any, any photography at all before that. I just went wow. into film school straight for it. And I kind of learned still photography after I was learning how to shoot in a way, which is kind of backwards, but um, right. I don't know. That was just, that yeah. was just the way that I did it. You know, I, I went to film school right out of high school. I knew it was what I wanted to do. I went into like a trade school st uh, style program at the LA film school back when it first opened. And I just kind of, it was like a year long pro program. It was really intensive. It was what I knew I wanted to do. And I put a camera in my hands immediately and I just kind of learned by doing. So Is that really your kind of recommendation for people who think that that's what they want? Do you think they should go to film school and, and, and try to learn by doing or what path would you suggest? I, I, I guess I would say again, it's what worked for me. The thing is like I, so many people start this in such a different way. It's hard to say that one way is uh, right versus another. I think that I knew what I wanted to do and I just went straight for it. And for me, that worked really well. I went to a film school that gave me a camera immediately. And for me, that also worked really well. I, you know, I, I, I couldn't really you know, for uh, film theory and, you know, history and all that is great, but it's like, I kind of feel like all of that sort of doesn't matter until you actually do it yourself and, and actually get your hands dirty and, and, and make mistakes. I, you know, I think that the first, I feel like the first four years worth of stuff that I did, I think, you know, most stuff, I, I can't even, I don't even, <laughs> you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just guessing the whole time. I still right. feel that way to a certain degree. It's just that you have more experience. So you have learned from a lot more mistakes. Well, but, you do um, a great job guessing if that's what you're still doing because I... Uh... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you used to still do it every day, um, but you just <laughs> you just guess better <laughs> because yeah. you just made those mistakes, I think. Um, but, you know, I also just... I. I I went to what I went to film school and then I was there. I was there for a year. And right after I graduated, I, 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 uh, I got a job in the equipment room at the school and I've worked in the equipment room for like three years. So I was checking out stuff to students while I was still break, taking breaks to shoot film theses. So I was like learning by just always getting in the middle of everything and making right. friends, making a network, making a network. Getting your hands dirty, the anyway. whole thing. Yeah, and like just building that kind of core group of friends who are like-minded and want to make movies also. And just, you know, I shot a lot of really bad movies. Uh, well, I started as shorts and then eventually I started getting features and and all of that was just because I would never say no. I said yes to everything. I wasn't picky. It's was like I, mm. I knew if, if I knew something was not going to be good, I was like, yeah, this isn't going to be good. But, you know, there's this one little part of it that I might be able to learn something on. So I'm gonna do. Right. And I'm going to do it and not have an attitude about it. I'm going to still do the best that I can and try to do a good job. And ultimately you do that, people notice, and then people will call you for another job. And that's kind yeah. of like how, how, it went, how it went forward for years. And then one, by the time I started finally getting decent, decent, decent sized features, a lot of those came from friends I had made in film school that had also right. rised, uh, you know, you know um, climbed the ladder in a way, like the producers and stuff. So, you know, in a way I feel like it, it's just, don't be, don't be an asshole. That's another big thing. I think we I think talk really about like, that. I think, on think this that really, show. I think that really like, I no, think we that talk has, about has that. gotten a leg up all the time. Sorry. Go ahead. We talk <laughs> about that on this show all the time. And I, I think you and I have discussed it as well. When I first started in this business, it was probably 60, 40 talent versus attitude. And now I would say it's 70, 30 attitude over talent because it's just too hard. It's too busy. And, you know, I think that 30% is not to be dismissed, but if you're cool to work with and easy, I mean, it's just so many people I know have lost jobs or 
I have thought of even just me working with students when they people ask me, hey, tell me the students. It's not necessarily the most talented students. It's the one who are have the best attitude and work yeah. hard and, you know. So, I mean, and I've, I've seen you work. So your big, the, what was the movie you did with Art Sue? That's the one that, that kind of broke you at the- uh... Oh yeah, it was my first, my first studio film was uh, Crank 2. Uh, high Crank, vintage. that's Crank 2, that's yeah. right. And then, yeah, you did it a lot after that. Uh, that's My Boy, Ghost Rider, a lot of Rob Zombie movies. Then you got in with uh, Seth Rogen, This Is The End, uh, Neighbors, Neighbors 2, The Interview, um, and then you got into uh, some, the woman who did the independent in San Francisco that went on to do the Melissa McCarthy movie. Uh, and the, you won in Sundance, right? That's best. I did, yeah. And even, even, even that movie, like, you know, just in terms of how networking works, it's like, you know, um, yeah. a, a big movie that started a lot of things for me that uh, is kind of the reason why I got a lot of those movies was McGrouper was this SNL Gruber, feature that yeah. I shot, McGruber. So I, 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 I love that movie. I love it too. And that movie really changed my career in a big way. You know, I had done like horror and action and all this like, you know, different like genre stuff. And then I got McGruber, which is the first like real comedy I got, but then we wanted to make it look like a real sort of like old school, like Michael Bay, Bruck, Simpson, Bruckheimer movie. You know, like that was right. the joke, you know, was to make it like actually have that kind of a look. And, and was so, that because of somebody you had gone to film school with as well? No, that was a job that I got. So that job, interestingly enough, my dad was doing the effects for it. And I think he had gotten the job before I did. He didn't get me in the door to do it though. It was the line producer knew me from some horror movie I had shot a few times, a few years before. And she got me into the mix and then I met Norma who directed it and then we've been friends ever since. So it's just, it's interesting how it all connects together. But, you know, Yorma, I did that movie for him. And then uh, a lot of the people in the comedy world like that, that got me the, that's my boy job. That got me the job ultimately in, in the door to meet Seth Rogen and those guys. Cause they liked the way McGruber looked. And I think Yorma was pitching me with those guys at a party or something. And like, I had a meeting for this is the end. And I've been with those guys ever since. Um, yeah. But then going back to Yorma, who I did McGruber with his, his wife, Mari Heller is who directed Diary of a Teenage Girl, which is the film I went right. to Sundance for. And she also directed, you know, um, the, uh, can't ever forgive me, you know, and uh, and you know, I, I I would have been with her on the uh, on the Mr. Rogers movie as well, but the movie I was directing happened at the same time, so yeah. so so that happens. But um, does that happen anyway. often where you there are contradicting schedules, and so you have to pick which one you're going for, or you miss out on something you really want to do because you already signed up for something else? There are, there are absolutely, and um, you know, I would say that even gets into. It, which is tricky because a lot of people that I end up working with, if I work with uh, for multiple films, you know, it's like we're working together because we like working together, but we also have become friends and we have like a sort of a friendly sort of working relationship. I mean, it, it, when I'm working with a director as a DP, oftentimes I feel like my best working relationships are those who I do make good friends with. And I feel like a lot of those um, stick around, you know, in a way yeah. that it, it just makes the job more rewarding in, in a way, because I feel like we're both willing to you know test each other in a way that's not negative but also but like making each other better at what we do to sort of make the best thing possible you know um but um sorry i just wandered away from what we were talking no, about no no, no, no I, I asked you I, I, yeah and the other thing is so we know that a that a dp uh, explain it to us if there's anything more that i'm missing you set up the shot you make sure the lighting is really really clean like you work with the director they say this is what we need to capture. You set up the lighting. The you, you before this, you've set out a palette, like you said. Um, and McGruber, the to the line was we want it to look like a hardcore action thing. So, since that overall umbrella, you set up every shot to fit that that mold, right? To fit to make it look like that and light it and, and yeah. I mean, ultimately, uh, I mean, ultimately, it's the DP's job to. Um, create what the director, how the director wants the story to be told, you know, how the director okay. wants it to feel. So I feel like it's, you know, when it comes down to it, um, it we're, we're there to, it, it, it's, we're there to tell the story. And, and it's like, if we're not, if what we're doing isn't serving the scene or the movie or telling the story in the right way, I feel like you're not like uh, doing your job, you know? Um, right. I feel like there's, I mean, that goes into just a philosophy of like, you know, you can, 
sure as a DP, you can learn how to light things and make things look good and look slick, but it's like, if it, look, if, if it looks cool, I think if something like looks cool and you're saying to yourself, wow, this looks cool. And you're not like just going, wow, this isn't an amazing moment or I'm not paying attention to that part of the scene. I feel like you're not doing your job right. Mm-hmm. It's like, I how think it often needs to- do you have a conflicting vision in terms of that as the director does? Because how often are, are you trying to focus on exactly making the shot look the way you're envisioning for the overall scope and the director has a, a different thought in mind? Well, I think a lot of that comes into what has, what work has gone into everything before you're even in that position, before you're even, before you're even on set, setting up that shot. You know, you've gone through weeks and weeks of prep to talk about how you want it to look, how you want it to feel, what color you want the walls painted in the set for whatever reason, you know, it's like what's going to be dressed with. There's so much thought has gone into every little thing that by the time you get there, you all kind of have these sort of checks and balances for like the looks and not only like, let, let, let's say it's like the rule book of how you decided for this thing to look and feel, you know I mean? For, mm-hmm. for MacGruber, it was easy because, you know, I love all of those 80s action movies that, that Yorma also loves. So honestly, I didn't really have to like, I just knew what those shots would feel like. It's like long lenses, low to the ground, wet ground, you know, wet downs and steam and just like keep the camera yeah. moving. All these just what like is a basic wet down? kind of like, Put down spraying water all over the water so it looks all shiny and glossy. It's just like yeah. a, well, the water like is spraying it all over the road. Stupid thing that makes right? no yeah. sense. Yeah, it's all yeah. over the road. Yeah, inexplicable. Um, yeah, inexplicable steam and water. Oh yeah, I mean it's like, Love that. It, but but it was easy to be like, oh, we want this scene to feel like the uh, the opening scene from Rambo three. I'd be like, okay, got it. He's in Thailand. Yeah. He's, he's building a, a temple with monks. Okay, good. I know what that felt like. <laughs> you know, it's like it's just like yeah. that was what we what we did then, but then. We would do stuff that was weird. Like I, I like to kind of take a couple of movies and sort of blend together, sort of a mix of that feeling, and then kind of apply that as sort of a rule set. And that's where I'm going to go to in terms of like where the lighting should be, what the camera should be, what kind of lenses we want. Um, and then from that standpoint, if we get into a hiccup with like what the director's thinking, what we want, we'll just kind of check each other off and say, well, if we did this, it kind of fits our style. This, if we do that, doesn't really fit what we talked about. Let's just fall into what we know is going to be, you know, have, have a continuity with the rest of the movie yeah. versus um, trying to tell the story. It's so hard. There's so many different little bits and pieces and nuances. Yeah, too. and I've seen you work. It kind of comes the, together. So um, tell us from, this is, an, you know, an actor show. What do you, what should an actor know about a DP and why is it important for them to, you know, it's ultimately important to be friendly with everybody on the set or get to know as many people on the set, but why is it important and and what should an actor really know, need to know about a DP? Well, again, I think it's probably different just depending on the personality of anybody you're working with. Um, right. But I think that, you know, a, a, as an actor working with a DP, um, you know, there's certain things that like, come with just being, it depends on the level of experience of a shoot you're on as well, in terms of like yeah. how experience the actors are and this and that. But if you're on like a professional shoot, you're gonna expect actors to just kind of have, and this is purely from a photographic standpoint, like a, a little bit of a, a a technical workflow going on in their process, as well as everything else they have to do. That technical thing is like, you know, you've probably heard the phrase, finding your light or hitting your mark right. or all these other things that are just like the technical thing where it's like, you know, again, personally, I don't, harp on that terribly it's like i would prefer if you hit this mark because i know that's where it's going to look the best if it's lit but honestly if you're this way or that way it's like i'm going to let it go because from my perspective you know outside of the director putting this all together the actors are the most important part of the movie and and, right i think without um creating that kind of comfort zone on the set i feel like you're not going to allow everyone to do their best work so right um you know, I think that's something that I try to take into account too when I'm shooting. So it's like, I, it's, it's, and I'm sort of backwards answering it from my perspective, but like. Yeah, um, but I think both is great. Yours it, and, I, mean, I, I will try to keep. Is it appropriate? Oh, go ahead. So I was just gonna say that I try to keep like, as often as I can, big movie lights out of the set and out of the way. Like, I don't like to kind of bog this immediate set down around actors if I can avoid it too, because it's like without that sort of freedom of feeling like you're in a real space, I feel like it can kind of like, Right. Know, there's, there's, there's a certain way to think probably you as an actor could be setting up for a shot and all of a sudden like all these things come in and just outside of the frame is like so much stuff you can't even move and it's like you don't know what's yeah. it's like you feel like you're in a weird little prison in a way and, yeah. I, and I think that like getting that far away 
uh, it just helps things and it can still look good. I mean, that's one thing. Um, yeah, yeah. What were you do gonna you, say, Rax? Do you have much of a dialogue with the actors? Like, are are you uh, okay with them asking you specific questions? Like, does this look better? Or does this look better? Would you rather me uh, angle this way? Or do you, would you prefer them to just do their thing and you don't really wanna have much of a breaking of that wall because you want them to just stay in what they're doing? I mean, I don't, I, I, I tend to not say anything unless I have to, to be honest. You know, I, I, I try to, I try to stay as removed and just out of the way. Like, you know, the last thing I think an actor needs is just a million different people talking to them right before they're about to do their singing. And it's like, if I can get out of the way of that, I'm going to do that. Right. Um, if I have to dip in and say like, Hey, excuse me, if you shift this way, it'll be a little bit better. Okay. Bye. It's like, it might be that, that sort of like a quick interaction, you know, but it's like, Right. I kind of want the actor to do what they think is instinctive and feels natural because I think that if you're giving too many of those technical notes, you can kind of start to get a little bit more of a kind of a right. Frankenstein performance because everyone's thinking they're thinking thinking about too much. <laughs> it's just right. You don't you want to keep them out of their head. You know that's going to work best to keep them out of the yeah. Head. And it's like we're all there to to to, to do the same to do the same thing, which is make a movie and make it as good as possible. So it's like, this is just stuff that I've, I think I've accumulated from my experience. It's more just like how I approach it, which is just like trying to be removed and I'll dip in whenever necessary to sort of make an adjustment. But I just try to stay out of the way. Right. I feel like that's yeah. mostly the best way for a lot of different departments in general. It's like everyone's there to do their, to do their job and everyone's hired because right. they're good at what they do in theory. So, you know, so long as yeah. we're all sort of working toward the same goal, which is this sort of overall picture that the director's kind of like explained to, to everybody at this point. To everybody. Do yeah. our thing. Yeah, yeah. So do you have, have any uh, do's and don'ts for actors? Like, what would you say, make sure you do? I mean, you mentioned a couple of things. Finding your light, guys. Uh, sometimes we forget that we're talking to people and know nothing. That means... So if you're some of they lit a certain thing and you stand behind an actor in a certain way, like me going back like this, my light gets a lot worse. Uh, it's it's stepping in a way so the way they lit you so you can be seen better and hitting a mark. And we did talk about that on one show is, you know, being at a specific place where the camera is and the lighting is. To Just to be clear, like it's not it's not that you guys know nothing. It's that you guys no, and that's are a saying. little greener in this field, perhaps. Some right, people exactly. watching. We have all different yeah. degrees of people we who have, have been all at this for a varying amount of times. But so, also you so guys we, know nothing. Yes. That's so I great. Mean, I would say it's like trying to find like finding the light, finding the lens, I would say is almost more is, is actually more important than finding the light when it comes down to it. You know, it's so easy to kind of line up for a shot. And if, if you see the lens in front of you and like someone's kind of standing right here, like it's better if you're right. there. No matter where yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you know, like like right. that's <laughs> like that's just something And that, if people uh, who are listening, Brandon put his hand in front of his face so we couldn't see him at all. So it's based your block yourself from the camera we were all I, I just remember this if we were told if the ca if you can't see the camera at all then the, pro the camera probably can't see you at all um yeah. that's certain kind of shots but in the most basic sense it probably Especially, what i'm hearing from you is it probably makes your job easier and better and and your work better when an actor is more tech savvy so that they know those things so that that's almost like um, second nature to them to make sure they take two inches to their right when they see where you are based on where the actor in front of them is. It sounds like that yeah. just makes everybody's job a little bit easier and the, and the picture better. Yeah, it does. And there's, you know, there, there's subtle things too. You know, it's like a lot of I think, trained actors will um, look at the, um, we'll just choose one eye of the other person to look at and look at the eye that's closest to the lens. And hold it there because it's easy to kind of bounce back and forth between pupils too. Like that's something that in a close up can also start to be something that um, can be distracting. I don't know if you know if that's something that you do, Sean. That's a Michael Caine thing. He taught Michael Caine talks about that. It, it, and it really, it, I think it makes a difference, but especially in a close up. Speaking of close ups, if, if, if like the frame is here at like the top of my eyebrows, the bottom of my chin, and like I think it's, it's a reason why it's good to know lenses, like big movements, like moving really fast in that is right. something that is, is really hard and can, and can also ruin a close-up. I think it's also trying to, and it just, it just builds into your technical experience. It's like if you have a, uh, if you build up kind of like a, um, you know, if you just learn lenses, you know, if you have a long lens or a close-up lens, it's like you don't have to do as much, if that makes sense, motion-wise. Even if right. it doesn't match what you were doing before, it's like slowing it down and making it more minimal will preserve the shot in a way, you know, stuff like that. Right. 
Right. But so, these are all just so like these are all just technical mechanical things. When you, you say know, even um, if it doesn't match, so you think that that's less important because leave that to the editor to figure out what she would rather use and make it all look good together. You would just rather somebody play to the shot than think about matching it. Well, I think matching is important, but it's. Um, I mean, let's say someone is, uh, I'm trying to think of a good uh, example of how to play it, but it's like, if you're in a wide shot and you're doing like this, these big and kind of crazy movements with like your arms or something like that, for example, and you want to cut to a closer shot, you can go closer and just do slightly smaller movements and you're still moving around, but it's still going right. to cut, even though it doesn't technically match with what's uh, exact from the wide shot to what's close, you know, that's something you can get away with. It's just like little cheats. I mean, you, you figure out. Yeah. Like, so just well, take you can get the time away with to now. understand Take the time, and I've said this before, when you start getting on sets, take the time. Don't sit in your trailer, not meeting anybody. Go a network, we talked about how important that is. Meet new people, I always say try to leave the set with at least two phone numbers, uh, if you can, or emails. But also take the time to go look and learn what is going on um, with the DP department or the sound department or the art department or the costume department, try to figure out everything. It makes it easier. Bradley Cooper spent just hours when he wasn't acting uh, for years before he even attempted to direct A Star is Born, just studying the different parts so he could understand more. It may seem boring at times too, like nothing's going on, but there's always something happening. And that's the thing. Yeah. And, it, and it's, um, and I would say that's another thing that is also can be frustrating is like, I, you know, I've, I've, def I've definitely dealt with actors who are also glued to like their cell phones, for example. And it's like, you're everyone's trying to like, to like work. And it's like, you're trying to like have someone who sit, hit the mark or figure out where they're going to go. And it's like, they're just on paying attention set? to something else. Oh, yeah. They have their it's, phone with them. They're doing that on set. Yeah. I mean, you know, people do it all wow. the time. During like so, a camera yeah. rehearsal. That's crazy. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen people do that before, but it's like, um, but even, but, even, but even just off, it's like, it's almost like, you know, I, I, don't, I feel like it might be a little bit too, I can't tell if I think it's too much or not how I know Tarantino just bans phones from sets completely and really mm -hmm. just kind of keeps everybody there and in it and in the moment. And, and I actually feel like, you know, I, I visited one of the sets once when they were shooting, I think they were shooting Django Unchained and we were doing This is the End down in, uh, down in New Orleans. Yeah, down in New Orleans. No one's on their phone. It's just like there's, you know, DiCaprio is just like reading a newspaper in a director's chair and everyone's just like hanging out and like focused and watching what's going on. And, and I think there's so much distractions without paying attention to what's happening that that also can kind of, I don't know, there's, 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 there's uh, it, it makes it, it's a valid point to not. <laughs> just well, it sounds like what you're saying is when you are lucky enough to be on a set, soak it all in. Yeah. Soak it all in. I mean, I remember I came down to uh, visit you then uh, on that, the, this is the end, to because I was shooting Hatchet 3 with our oh, friend yeah. PJ McDonald. And I came and visited you and it was just so, so cool to see you work. And I just remember like kind of shadowing you and seeing how you did everything and how you set up these crazy shots. And, you know, it was really, it was really amazing. But but it, again, you have to soak it. You have to kind of soak it all in and try to learn. And and you know, I I was guilty of that for a while. Just like, ooh, this is great. I'm gonna bring my pillow. I'm gonna read a book. I'm gonna listen to some podcast. And then I just realized, wow, it's so useless to sit in my dressing. There's so many. I'm missing opportunity after opportunity to learn stuff. You know, so yeah, yeah it's uh, it's definitely something I. I want to learn more of when we all should learn more of that's a really good do and don't um we are getting lower on the time but uh i think roxy you would agree i think we have to have brandon back as a director because we're talking a lot about dp yeah 100 percent. because a, a lot of people do exactly that they make the jump uh or do both things simultaneously dp and then become director or uh, I would love to hear more stories about that. So yes, we're, we're not letting you off the hook. Uh, we need a, a episode two. Well, so we also- well, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so we also, what I think is instead of going into that story of the one we were talking about, our recent project, we'll say that for directing, but here's how things work, guys. So I did this movie, Laid to Rest. I met Brandon, I'm, I'm sorry, I met uh, Jason and his sister, Sarah, came back. We did this movie, The FP. 
uh, very fun. I've talked about it before. Jason and Talay were on uh, the show as well, talking about independent filmmaking. We brought up the FP. Um, so then, I, as I mentioned earlier, if you don't remember, Brandon DP with Rob Zombie for several films, and he was showing him uh, the movie, the FP, and when my part came up, he kind of turned to Brandon and went, oh, I like that guy. That guy's, that guy's cool. And I remember Brandon calling me from that second one, hey, Rob Zombie's a fan of yours and thinks you're cool. And I was like, great. So you probably uh, thought that would be the end of that, but just compliments enough. Yeah. That so Zombie three likes weeks it. later, I get a call saying Rob Zombie wants to come to a part on Halloween too. Well, Brandon didn't even really know it until he saw the call sheet and went, what? You called Sean Wayne? He goes, yeah, after seeing your movie, maybe you can think of this part. So I went out there. No way. Yeah. yeah. And so, I, Brandon, you honestly, you had no idea until you saw the call sheet. Yeah. No, I mean. Um, well, pre-production I, I or mean, whatever, like a week before. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, it, I did not know that Rob had reached out to Sean or his people to do it. I, I, I knew yeah. that he had seen the movie, but. Um, but it was awesome. You, you yeah, came so and you got I, and you got and you got rained out and got to spend like an got extra rained week. Rained out, because, so I got uh, to stay yeah. for a few more extra <laughs> days, and then we shot the thing. But Rob and I hung out, had a really cool time talking films all night, and then after that, he considered me a friend. So we went to his fiftieth birthday, and we, you and I went to the premiere of Thirty One and uh, not Thirty One, Lords of Salem, and yeah. a bunch of different other things, and. Uh, 10 years later, Rob texted me directly and said, do you want to do a part in my sequel for Devil's Rejects called Three from Hell? And that was all literally from having fun in Maryland, you know, 12 years before that. So, you know, that's the weirdness of all of this stuff. And then I can go in and Brandon and I had worked together. If you guys are watching me on TikTok, the Dorothy's are blowing up. Uh, and that's was shot by Brandon. Uh, Brandon and I went up in the FP one day and shot the uh, shot the Dorothy Fifty Years Later shorts that are all that's over right. TikTok right now, and done a bunch of different things together. So we'll definitely have to bring yeah, you back. Now, uh, as a and now, now here you are in my movie. It'll come out here. At some yeah, point. yeah, we'll as a director. So that's two. what we have we'll to. Part yeah, part two for sure. But I think this is really helpful for actors to understand DPs and what they do. I mean, wouldn't you agree, Rox? Yeah, yeah. I guess at some point we should have uh, maybe said DP, director of photography. So yeah, <laughs> director that, of photography. Maybe right. that helps too, in case you yeah. made it this far in this episode and still were unclear. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, you will definitely have to bring you back because then, you know, as some people do, and it's not uncommon, that's what Jan de Bont did. That's what, who else? The, uh, we used to work with the Cohen brothers that did uh, oh, Barry Sonnenfeld. Barry Sonnenfeld. A lot of DPs go into directing. And so we'd love to talk to you about how that transitioned and stuff. Sure. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. Definitely have to have you back. So, um, hope you guys learned a lot about this. It's always fun. Uh, Roxy, where can we find you? Everywhere at Roxy Stryer. Uh, I stream live from my YouTube every single day, 1 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, and I've had some awesome guests on recently. So you're going to want to make sure you check that out. YouTube.com slash Roxy Stryer. Thank you guys so much for helping me hit 20,000 subscribers. That was awesome. Nice. Uh, you, you guys really did help. So thank you so much for doing that. And uh, I'll, I'll see you there tomorrow at one. There you go. And I, uh, I'm everywhere at Sean Whalen Actor, except on TikTok. I'm at Sean Whalen 19. You can find me there. I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, and Brandon, do you have a social media presence anywhere that they, people could find you? Oh, uh, man, barely. Uh, I'm, I have a Twitter <laughs> account. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Is, There's people just, who don't. Yeah. I, ta- but, I tried to tag you on Twitter for this episode, but I used a hashtag for your name instead because I couldn't figure out which one was you. There was an accountant... <laughs> A cat person. <laughs> oh, I think uh, I think mine's actually Betro, which is the character from the FP. Yeah, it's from on there somewhere. Betro, I think it's yeah. B underscore T R O. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Fine, that, that's how, so I, that's we how active I am. We will definitely have you back for part two and how you what you learned from directors and how that helped you direct. So stay tuned awesome. for that. And as always, uh, thank you for letting me be part of your journey. 
Our founder, Kevin Undergaro, and me, Maria Menunos, would like to thank you for tuning in to AfterBuzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first, we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to AfterBuzzTV.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. <laughs> the views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principal.